A very warm welcome to all of you. You know, the introducer's task normally is to be very short, but I think in my lifetime this is going to be the shortest. Perhaps because I don't need to introduce the guest today, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the name, and the name speaks for itself. So ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, we welcome Sri Firoz Varun Gandhiji to this center. Though uh, I don't need, I don't think we need a formal introduction, but uh, I'll do the courtesies first. Uh, Sri Firoz Varun Gandhi is a second term member of parliament who represented the Pilivit constituency in 2009 and was elected from the Sultanpur constituency in 2014, winning both the elections by record margin. He was the youngest ever National Secretary of the BJP from 2008 to 11, and the youngest ever National General Secretary of the party from 2011 to 2014. He is a member of the National Executive of the BJP. Sri Gandhi has been a member of a number of parliamentary standing committees, including those on defense and external affairs. He is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. I think this is most important, uh, especially from the point of view that I've just come back from there. A graduate from the London School of Economics, Sri Gandhi was the first non-British to be elected the president of London University. <laughs> he is widely respected opinion leader and policy analyst, writing widely in English for the Hindu Economic Times, Hindi TV, and subsequently in Hindi for Amar Ujala, Nabharat Times, Rajasthan Patrika, Hindustan. Sri Gandhi also writes in other important regional languages for Lokmat, Malayala Manorma, Vijayavani, among others, making him the widest, widest read columnist in the country, reaching over 200 million readers. A poet by inclination, Sri Gandhi has published two best-selling volumes of poetry, The Otherness of Self, and stillness. Stillness broke sales records, becoming the best selling non fiction book of the 2015, selling over 10,000 copies in its first two days of release. He is currently working on his third book of poetry titled Surrender, while also traveling extensively to, to research for a book steeped in development agrarian economics, which seeks to answer the fundamental question. What is the economic future of Indian villages? Both these books are due to release in 2018, and we look forward to it. Since becoming an MP in 2009, now this is again a, a very important line that I'm trying to mention and to stress on this. Sri Gandhi has never drawn a salary, directly donating it to the families of the farmers that had committed suicide. <laughs> In 2014, Sri Gandhi took a pledge of starting a subaltern movement that would aim to rid as many farmers of their immediate debt as possible while creating for them a program that ensured they do not fall back into the debt. He donated one crore of his own money while crowdfunding locally across the states of Uttar Pradesh, reaching out to the local elites as well as large farmers to contribute he visited over 20 districts in the state, including Agra, Meerut, Muzaffarnagar, Bijnor, Bahraich, Lakhimpur, Kheri, Sultanpur, Sitapur, and Muradabad, Allahabad, and Aligarh. Over 1.5 years and managed to, almost half, one and a half years, and managed to raise over 22.6 crores, which was immediately deposited in the accounts of the said farmers. In this manner, over 4,700 farmers became debt free. His latest initiative <laughs> is to provide permanent structure, pakka homes to people who have never owned them or lived in them. Even in previous generations, he started with a personal donation of 100 homes in his constituency of Sultanpur. As previously done, he seeks to broad base in this into a movement, planning to once again travel and crowdfund nationally, this time around in order to build 1,000 homes by the year end, reaching out to the local elite as well as large farmers to contribute. His aims, he aims to provide the homeless with a psychological and material cushion against being completely ravaged by poverty while also providing them with a sense of honor and a sense of community. 
We are indeed privileged to have you here, sir. Uh, friends, the other person that I want to introduce to you is Professor Rekha Saxena, uh, a well-known author, a well-known intellectual, an authority on Indian politics. Time does, time does not permit me to go into the details of all that she has done. Uh, but, but suffice it, it, is it to just to say that this is the book, the latest cover of the book on Indian politics, and I'm sure uh, you would benefit by reading it, and I'm sure Rekha Saxena Ji will be here at times to guide you to the best of her abilities. And I think it's also pertinent uh, that from on my part, I introduce the crowd, our students to you, the, the alternative learning system was founded almost 20 years ago, and from a humble beginning, today you have uh, these many students sitting here and equal number sitting downstairs in another classroom where the direct telecast is being relayed. Apart from that, you have 56 centers across the country which is connected by the satellite, and they're all li live with us. Perhaps towards the end, they would also be interacting with you. I, I, I can say this with conviction, that because we produce almost 200 to 300 bureaucrats every year from across the background and different streams, I'll not be surprised if every third or the second of people sitting here would end up becoming a bureaucrat by your blessings next year. A very warm welcome to both the guests and I think before we let the guests speak, it's uh, just a custom that we, I, may I request Manish to honor Mr. Varun Gandhi with a bouquet. Oh. Where's the bouquet? Bouquet can Oh, okay. okay. May I request uh, dear friend Jojo to Okay, see, calm down, calm down. I know, see, Jojo is nothing else but a bundle of energy, right? <laughs> okay, one more thing. Before I give it to our dear friend, Professor Rekha Saxena, may I request Manish to introduce or to say a few words? Thank you. So, good morning to all of you. Uh, respected member of parliament, Firoz Varun Gandhi from Sultanpur constituency, who is the guest speaker for today's function. Madam Rekha Saxena, who is a very eminent political scientist and has authored several books on Indian polity, constitution, party system, election. She is the professor at University of Delhi. Respected Jojo Matthew, sir. <laughs> Chief Executive Director, ALS. And a friend, guide, philosopher. <laughs> and a friend, guide, philosopher for me, Dr. Chandrachur Singh. So officially, I would like to welcome Sri Firoz Varun Gandhi for this special session in which he will be delivering a lecture on prospects of just India. And sir, really it's an honor for ALS that you accepted our invitation to interact and address our students. Many of them will become the civil servant and will be the steel frame of nation in days to come. 
I welcome you, sir, on behalf of ALS family. I also take this opportunity to welcome Madam Rekha Saxena, who also accepted our invitation <laughs> to preside over this special session. And she also was instrumental in reaching out to Sri Varun Gandhi so that he can give consent to come over at this place and interact with you. I welcome Madam you. I would also like to welcome uh, Chandrachur sir, because he has been associated with us in different way, and he is also the head of the department political science at prestigious Hindu college, University of Delhi, and uh, <laughs> we keep on inviting him for interaction with the student, and every time on a very short notice when we invite, he accepts our invitation to interact with the student. I would like to welcome him. I would like to welcome each and every one present in this hall and 56 centers across India that you all have you know, eagerly waiting for listening to Sri Varun Firoz Gandhi, right? And he will deliver this lecture, Prospects of a Just India. To add on, I will say that such nature topics are nowadays very important from your exam point of view as well, because in the recent past, we have seen the trend that they are asking you people to write in main exam essay on such nature topic. So academically it will be enriching and of course otherwise it will be enriching because what I have learnt about Sri Firoz Varun Gandhi that everybody knows that he is a politician but in addition to being a politician he is a very eminent social scientist who has got opinion on different social political issues and the politics was in his blood because of which you must have heard that he graduated from London School of Economics and have rare distinction to be the president of this university, non-British president of London University. So I would not take much time and I would not like to stand between you and him. So I would like to welcome each and everyone present here and I would like to request Madam Rekha Saxena to come and deliver the presidential address, after which Sri Varud Gandhi will. And one more announcement. Towards the end, you all have the freedom to ask questions related with the topic which will be discussed and a lecture will be delivered by uh, Firoz Varun Gandhi. And even this applies to students who are sitting across 56 centers. You feel free to ask questions so that it's a very interacting and enriching experience for all of you. So I would now hand over to ma'am. Yeah. OK. So very good morning to everybody. Uh, yeah. uh, to begin with, I would like to thank ALS for uh, extending this kind invitation to me. I have never interacted with uh, any co students at any coaching institute, so I'm really happy, and I look forward to coming here more frequently in the future. So uh, I know you must be very eager to listen to Mr. Gandhi, so I will be very brief. I'll just uh, flash out certain issues to set the ball rolling for discussion for his lecture. Uh, I think uh, we are living in an age where major ideologies that dominated the modern world uh, has come into a state of fatigue and crisis. And in the post-World War II world, liberal democracy has produced welfare state, and social democracy has created even more universal, substantial welfare states, as you see in uh, Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden. Now, in addition to these ideologies, communism also collapsed by the end of 1980s. And in this atmosphere, Justice, which has been the foundational value for all these modern ideologies in different ways, has you know, become a casualty, both in politics within nations as well as politics among nations in global arena. Neoliberalism, as uh, you must have studied, preached by Frederick Hayek, Milton Friedman, Robert Nozick in political theory, and Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan in politics, uh, uh, saw the accidents to the dominant position uh, in the backdrop of the collapse of communism and crisis of welfare states. So this uh, neoliberal ideology was 
uncritically accepted by the centers of the metropolitan capitalism as well as also prescribed to the developing countries through multinational institutions like World Bank, IMF, WTO, etc. However, I think along the road on this line, financial crisis that appeared in the East Asian miracle economies in 1997, like South Korea, Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, and it overtook the satidal of capitalism itself in North America and Western Europe in 2008 and 2009. Uh, so I think the, the, like the leading economist Joseph Stiglitz has very forcefully argued that the extent of inequalities in the developed capitalist democracies, it has reached an unprecedented level today. Similarly, Amartya Sen has also been repeatedly lamenting the increasing inequalities in India and he has been arguing for a major shift in public expenditure in social sectors like health and uh, education to deal with this deepening crisis. And you'll be surprised to know that according to an economic survey, one of the distinctive feature of the Indian economic model is the weakness of the state capacity, especially in you know, delivering essential services like health and education. <coughs> now John Rawls, he also wrote his celebrated model, you know, classic and political theory in his work, A Theory of Justice. And uh, he has also addressed this question uh, in his pandering text, you know, Global Justice, in the book Law of the Peoples, uh, talking about justice, uh, that it should be available to all. So I think uh, there have been winners and losers in the process of globalization today in almost all parts of the world. But I think India has perhaps been the worst sufferer. And according to this uh, recent Oxfam International Survey, our uh, uh, economics uh, that is transferring wealth to uh, most of the elite, elite, rich elites at the expense of the poorest of the society, especially women. And according to the, their data, uh, the, there has been growing uh, income inequality in India. And India, India's richest 1% today hold huge 58% of the country's total wealth, which is, uh, which is higher than the global figure of 50%. And moreover, I would say that there's a huge gap in gender justice. And women from 60% 60, 60 of the lowest, they are the 60% of the lowest paid wage laborer in India. To conclude, I would say that India, of course, it's a fast growing economy, but we have to give have nots their due and ensure that there's, you know, justice and equality for all. And here I'm reminded of, you know, uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar's last speech that he gave to the Constituent Assembly on 25th November 1949, where he said that political democracy is incomplete without social and economic democracy. So I think justice has been a very burning issue today than it was ever before. And uh, Mr. Gandhi will address you know, on this issue in his lecture. So uh, we really look forward to hearing him. Thank you so much. How do you do it? Just just put it here. Yeah. And just go. Is it like Okay. It's very fancy. I don't know where to look. <laughs> um, Professor Rekha Saxena ji, um, respected Sri Jojo Matthew ji, uh, respected Sri Manish Gautam ji, and uh, other near Professor Chandachur Singh ji. Um, friends, when I was told that uh, this was a breeding ground for future bureaucracy, I said, now I know who to blame. <laughs> you know, you uh, gave me a beautiful bouquet of flowers uh, to welcome me. But wherever I go, they usually give you flowers. And I always say to them that, you know, flowers are dead things. So to start a relationship, one should never give anybody flowers. One should give uh, a podha, you know, a small potted plant, because that then begins. You know, a new relationship. And then when you plant it into a tree, then that. Uh, um, 
what does it mean to be a young Indian today? What does it mean to be a citizen? What does democracy really mean? What is citizen intervention? What is the historicity of all of this? I just want to get to this. In the 1960s, uh, ships carrying PL-480 wheat were coming to India from the United States. And suddenly they turned around and went elsewhere. And it was attributed to the fact that the then Prime Minister, Srimati Indira Gandhi, had criticized America's intervention in Vietnam. And when uh, the then President Lyndon Johnson was asked uh, why uh, this special censure was really given to India when Secretary General of the UN, Yu Thant, the Pope, etc., had all criticized this war, uh, he said, well, they don't eat our wheat. You know, we've had times in our country where late Prime Minister Shastri had to request the country to eat once a day so that there would be enough for all. And if a far-sighted agriculture minister, Sri Subramaniam, had not gone to Mexico and really got that hybrid for us, so many more people in our country would be starving today and the Green Revolution would never have happened. But we've come a long way since then. Today, we are arguably the second or the third largest producer of wheat and rice in the world. Although our population has tripled, five times wheat produ uh, rice production has tripled and wheat production has gone 15 times. So we really have um, made some headway. When we look at the 1980s to jump forward, we had the towards the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, we had a huge economic crevice that we were going to fall into. All of you remember that we were unable to pay our loans to the World Bank, and we had to take an emergency loan from the IMF to pay that 1,200 crores that we needed to pay. And we had to pledge 67 tons of gold to do so. Uh, former Pri uh, Prime Minister Chandrasekhar Ji got a lot of flack for doing it. But I think, frankly, anybody in his position would have done the same. But we are not quite in that state anymore. Today, we have, we're ninth in the world in nominal GDP. By 2050, we will have the third largest GDP in the world. Uh, according to the World Bank's global economic prospects, we are the fourth fastest growing economy in the world. And if you just look at 1991, which is the date that I'm talking about and now, and just look at two indicators, which is foreign investment and foreign reserves, in 91, we had foreign investments of 0 0.07 billion. And in 2016, we had foreign investments of 371 billion. And our foreign reserves, which were 5 billion, 5.8 billion actually in 91, are now 361 billion. So we've come a long way. But yet, they remain very blaring questions that need to be answered. Last year, a retired teacher from Rajasthan, Deep Chand Sharma, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister's office. And he said that, upon my retirement, I shall pledge a check of one lakh rupees to the poorest person in India. Could you kindly find that person and connect me with them? After two months, he got a letter saying, I'm sorry, we have no record of the poorest people in this country, which in itself is very ironical, considering we have the largest amount of poor people in the world in India, approximately 29.5% of our population. I think the figure is about 370 million odd people. Just last month, I was in Punjab, and we went... Uh, 
to Fatehgarh Sahib. And we went to the house of a farmer who had killed himself because of the social stigma of what in Hindi you call uh, ghar ki kurki lagana. They had locked his house and because he was unable to pay a loan of 52,000 rupees, he had not only killed himself but he killed his whole family, which in South India, in Northeast, in parts of Northern India, particularly in Rajasthan, etc., are things that, and in Bundelkhand, of course, you hear about almost all the time. Uh, and they didn't even have money to cremate him, uh, which, you know, is the saddest part of all. For the last few months, all of you have seen in the national capital, farmers from Tamil Nadu sitting and uh, exhorting farmers all over the country from Jantar Mantar. And and I was one of the few MPs that visited, and in their hand they had skulls of other farmers from Tamil Nadu who had committed suicide. They drank their own urine just to protest against the horrific way in which farmers in India have been treated, not just for the last five years, but for the last you know hundreds of years. And, uh, and yet, the same month, the Tamil Nadu Assembly gave to itself a 200% pay hike for all its MLAs. I found it really shameful. And I gave a speech in Parliament saying the time has come where members of Parliament and MLAs of state assemblies should not arrogate to themselves the power to increase their salary at will. There needs to be some constitutional amendment, some statutory mechanism whereby Eminent persons, academics, retired judiciary, retired bureaucracy can decide whether members of parliament, members of legislative assembly deserve a pay hike. What will it cost to the exchequer? What will be the meaning of it? In the last, in the last five years, members of parliament have increased their own salary by 400%. And nearly every single statistic shows that over the last 10 years, Parliament has functioned in the most appallingly mediocre manner. However, this is not a speech on political reform. It is a speech on different kinds of justice and the way to get there. Coming back to how rich people have been treated in this country. So we have approximately 8 lakh crores of NPAs uh, with government-owned banks in our country. And uh, of that, I just want to say that 12 accounts, just 12 accounts in our country account for 27% of all NPAs. Just 12 rich people. I don't want to take any names here. This is not a witch hunt. That should be left to my role in parliament. Uh, but at the same time, I do want to say that out of these 12 people, I read in a magazine last month that one of them had their daughter married in Italy and the marriage cost 500 crore rupees. I wrote a letter, of course it was not answered, uh, to the finance minister. I said, sir, I want to know how many farmers small entrepreneurs, labor, artisans have been arrested for non-payment of dues? And how many people amongst the top 10 defaulters have been arrested in the, our country? The truth is, two of them have been arrested. And how long have they been arrested for? One for four hours and one for 24 hours. So let's just say that the laws are not quite equal for all. Uh, when we look at the inequality gap, Professor Saxena ji said that 1% of people in India own 58% of assets. It's true, except now the figure is 59.8%. So we're actually doing worse and worse as we go along. The country is becoming more unequal. Just to flag uh, two issues, 
the bottom 70% of Indians just own 7% of Indian assets and 57 billionaires in India, 57 billionaires own more assets than the bottom 60% of India combined. 57% of people own more assets than the bottom 60% of Indians combined. If we want to look at whether we're becoming more equal or more unequal, I just have two uh, things I'd like to say. One, the average value of assets held by a household in our country has risen to approximately 2.6, 2.8 crore rupees uh, over the last 10 years. It's a good raise. It is 50,000 times the amount of assets of a person in the lowest 10% of India. 50,000 times the amount of assets. If you look at a country like Japan, the figure is just about 200 and 80% to 360% more. When we look at inequality in earnings, so if you take the earnings of the top 10% of India and the bottom 10% of India, in 1970, the top 10% of India earned 12 times more, sorry, earned six times more than the bottom 10% of India. Today, the bottom 10% is 12 times less than the top 10%. So we're exactly double as unequal as we need to be. A lot, you know, where everybody's talking about demographic dividend, everybody's talking about young people. But, you know, the truth is not as rosy as it's made out to be. In our country, more than 30% of the 13 crore people, uh, sorry, 13 crore people, which is 30% of the people aged between 15 and 40, are neither employed nor in education and nor have any training. I asked a question in Parliament. I said, I want to know what is the kind of training that is being most espoused today in this new skill development ministry? And I said, I only want to know it for the state of Uttar Pradesh because I am elected from there and I just want to know what projects are going on there. And I was amazed by the answer. So the answer was that the number one training that is being given in the state of Uttar Pradesh by the Ministry of Skill Development is for the job of a chokidar. Now, I was a bit befuddled by this because I said, a chokidar is just a guy in a uniform. What is the training that is imparted to a chokidar? Is there any particular skill set imparted to him? If he gets kicked out of that job, can he use those quote-unquote skills to get employed elsewhere? If you're a cook, you're a driver, you have a skill set, right? If you're a chokidar, I mean, <laughs> of the 430 million young people in India, 86% drop out of school after the age of 15. Only 2% can access formal training. But, you know, one of the aspects that I want to look at today is how young people are the answer, not how young people are the question. In a small village in Uttarakhand in the 1970s, Chandi Prasad Bhatt and Sundarlal Bahuguna became, be, began the Chipko Andolan. And uh, as you can understand, it was a particularly difficult time to start a movement because there was no internet, there were no cellular phones. For that matter, there were very few phones in the hills. And it was mainly the women, actually, that went door to door, village to village, and said, these trees are our future, these trees are our protection, these trees are our gods, and we have to save them. 
And the Chipko Andolan went so viral, to use a modern word, that the then Uttar Pradesh government, led by Narayanda Tiwari, uh, actually uh, put a stop to tree felling for 10 years. But today, it's a wonderful time to be young and to be an activist. Look at what happened in Bangalore, where the steel flyover was going to be made, and young people in Bangalore said that 1,800 of the oldest and the largest and the most important trees are going to be cut, and we're going to agitate against this. And they made a uh, social media group on Facebook and on WhatsApp, and they said anybody that is agitated about this can please uh, put their name or give a missed call. And one lakh people gave missed calls in uh, one day. And then it raised their level of confidence. And they said, now, anybody else that wants to come forward, we're doing a human chain to show our strength around these trees. And in two days' time, on a Sunday, 16,000 young people went on the roads in Bangalore. And because of that, the chief minister had to then say, OK, I stand down. We're going to find a new way to build a steel flyover. And I thought it was an amazing uh, strength of young people that was demonstrated. And it's not always posh or um, you know, uh, people from big metros that can do anything. In Telangana, there was a place I went in, uh, in Medak called a uh, district called Vemulaghat, where there was the poorest people in our country protesting the Malana Sagar Reservoir project for three reasons. One, it was going to drown about 24 villages. Two, the land acquisition uh, that they were following, which was an order called GO123, was violative of the Land Acquisition Act 2013. And three, the amount of money that they were getting in terms of compensation was A, not enough as per the market value of the land, and B, it was not given to more than about 15% of the population. So they protested. They did a hunger strike for 150 days continuously, but nobody listened. And then they filed right to information. They went to the information commissioner. They went to court. And finally, in Hyderabad, the high court ruled in the favor of the poor people. And they said that, number one, you have to give compensation to landless people, to artisans, to sharecroppers, to all of them. You have to give the market rate of the land, which is about 17 uh, lakh rupees an acre versus about 4 lakh rupees an acre, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they won. And, and these people who had no education, who had you know, very little money, uh, they were able to fight the state and win. In Maharashtra, uh, an amazing example is a small block in Nasik district called Sinar. Sinar was called the driest block in, in Maharashtra because not even one crop used to grow properly there in the 1960s and 70s. And at that time, a 70-year-old woman called Thakubai Gurule said, I don't want to die just having lived a life with no deeper meaning. And she said, I want to do something for this earth. And so she said, we will start digging wells. And we will start with water conservation, water harvesting. And this was much before water harvesting was fashionable. And she said, we will start digging wells in each village. And I will go from village at this age of 72. And they, they dug 25,000 wells in the block, which is an amazing thing. I've seen it myself. And because of that, over the next 10 to 15 years, when it was you know, uh, massively irrigated, it became the most fertile land in the whole state. And from having almost no crops a year, they started having two to three crops every year. And in fact, grape cultivation started from this block. But of course, politicians, like all uh, scavengers, went and started looking at this as a 
crucial way to make money. And suddenly, India bulls moved in and got an SEZ. Now, I'm totally against the concept of SEZs. SEZs all over the world are a hugely failed concept, have never resulted in any amount of money for local people, never resulted in local jobs, and never really resulted in anything except taking people's fertile land, giving it for large go-downs and factories, which then stop working 10, 15, 20 years later anyway. Um, in any case, to cut a long story short, an agitation was started by this lady and her son, Ramnath Gurule, who then said that we are going to resist in a peaceful Gandhian manner. And they went forward. And when finally uh, the people from India Wolves came to take possession of the land, over 150,000 women sat in their fields and said that we will consume poison pesticide, fertilizer, and do a mass suicide, and this will be on your hand. And of course, judging the public mood, they moved back. My point is not that we should be thinking of drastic actions at every given point. But my point is, today, you have more than 15 crore people on WhatsApp in our country. You have approximately the same on Facebook. The opportunity for mass mobilization for positive ends is endless today. You know, if, if everybody here listening to me just decides to write in to their local MP saying, why has this not been done, or decides to file an RTI, or decides to go on a local television channel and agitate against something, or decides to plant a tree, a fruit-bearing tree today, then this country would be the richer for it. I want to talk very briefly just about how inequality is perpetuated through education and through healthcare. You know, when we look at uh, education, one of the first things we need to look at is this trend towards private education. Now, I'm in favor of a increased private education because it leads to a greater uh, you know, qualitative slant for young people to go forward. But how many people can really afford private education in our country? So in the last 10 years, we've gone from 72% people going to government schools for primary education to 62% going to uh, government schools for primary education. But if you look at the urban statistics in our, uh, in our country, uh, we have gone in uh, just in the NCR. We have gone from 2000 to 2017 from 61% of people going to government schools for primary and secondary education, now only to 31% of people going to government schools in primary and secondary education, just in the NCR. But also this extrapolates to much of urban India, Mumbai, Calcutta, etc. Uh, but the fact is not that there is a gulf and it's widening. It's how much it's widening. I mean. We, everybody talks about NPAs, right? Everybody says NP, But how many people here know about education NPAs? Do you know that in the last 15 years, the education NPAs have gone to 4,800 crores in our country? So that means middle class people, lower middle class people, poor people who are desperate to give their children a decent education taking loans of 70,000 and 1 lakh and 1 lakh 50,000 and then not being able to pay it and defaulting. In uh, Kerala, I heard uh, you know, a terrible example of a person called Katie Joseph who wanted to make his daughter a nurse and he took a 3.25 lakh rupee loan and uh, they paid and she did become a nurse uh, in the district hospital but as you know district hospitals don't pay very much. And so they paid it back slowly, slowly, and 50,000 rupees, 54,000 rupees of it was pending. And this poor uh, man was put in jail 
He was humiliated, his house was raided, and he was put in jail. And finally, he had to even sell the vessels in his house to pay back this loan. I'm just amazed that this treatment would only be given to middle class people and to poorer people in our country. And for education, that too. You know, one would think that we must be lenient on things like education loans and healthcare loans because everybody who goes to poorer sections of India will tell you that the dreams of the next generation that follow us, as you know better than me, lie on the education that they receive and the security that they receive through this treasure that is education. When we even look at, uh, you know, when we look at healthcare, and this is even worse because in our country, one crore people fall below the below poverty line every year, one crore people because of out of pocket expenditure on healthcare costs. One crore people every year. And while it's true that uh, the share of government expenditure as a percentage of total expenditure on healthcare has gone up from 22% to 29% in the last five years, it is still a very, very small percentage as when looked at in global comparisons. Just for instance, when we look at the amount of household money that is spent on pharmaceuticals, on pharmacies, on medicines, we can see that in our country, 1.5 lakh crore every year goes to pharmacies. The amount of money that government spends as a percentage on, uh, for medicines in terms, of, uh, global sp in terms of national spending is just 4%. So 96% of money that is being spent on medicines is being spent by people out of their own pocket. Now to you and me, it seems an obvious thing that, okay, if we're ill, we will buy a paracetamol or digene or whatever. But think of the person who, can, who is lying outside All India Medical Institute for one month, two months, four months, and waiting for their quote-unquote treatment. And when they're told that, I'm sorry, you have to spend 5,000 rupees every week on medicines, Think of the amount of people in India that just drop dead because they cannot afford the amount of money on medication. Forget the treatment. In China, 40% of all pharmaceutical spending or pharmacy spending is done by the state. In uh, France and Germany and UK, it's 75%. Oh, there you have an NHS, etc. But you know we should too. When you look at the average household income in our country being between five and 10,000 rupees a month, you know, even the most uh, basic treatment at a government hospital can set you back extraordinarily. Now, for instance, according to the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority in India, 86% of the rural population and 80% of the urban population in India have no insurance. They have no health care insurance, and so therefore they have absolutely no immunity if they fall ill in financial terms. So, And if you compare it, I'm not even comparing it with countries like Norway and Sweden. If you even compare it with a BRICS country like South Africa, the out-of-pocket expenditure in South Africa is just 12.5%. Uh, and you see, the fact is that when you fall ill, you either take a loan or you dip into your life savings. In India, the statistic is 78% of people dip, dip into their life savings. Uh, that means break FDs, etc. when they fall ill. And all of you know this because your families at some point or the other have been through this. I mean, if you go to a private hospital, in, uh, if you have a heart attack and you go to a private hospital in Delhi, the heart attack may not kill you, but the bill will certainly... Uh... <laughs> you know, and the estimates that are spent, 8,000 crores has been spent on government hospitals by Indians in the last one year. 
64,000 crores has been spent on private hospitals. This is not a statistic that we should be proud of as a country. Uh, and in the last 10 years, 3.2% of Indians have fallen below the poverty line just because of healthcare costs. I mean, you know, I'm a member of parliament. You go to your constituency, go to any constituency, and 75% of the people who come to you will come to you for some help in healthcare spending. And they will say that my father has fallen ill, my daughter has fallen ill, and we have sold everything we have. We have sold our land, we have sold our cattle, you know, we have done everything we could, and now she's still suffering. You tell me what to do. And you don't know what to tell them. And that's the truth. Uh, you know, while all these figures make one think, the most important thing in our country today is that we are a young nation. And I see, and I've been writing this book, which will be out next year, which is The Economic Future of Indian Villages. And it's a dense economic work. But in order to write it, I had to travel very extensively for the last two years, and will travel this year as well. And I've come across examples of the most extraordinary young people and how they've given back to society. And I'd like to tell you about this, because this ties in with our larger theme of justice. I went to a village in Murshidabad district in West Bengal, which is now, I think, called Bengal, uh, called Bhapta. And there was a boy um, who's now become very famous called Babar Ali. And Babar, when he was uh, nine years old, was the only person in his village that was going to school. And he would go to school because he realized the unfairness of all this. So he would go, and every day he would come back, and whatever he was taught that day, he would teach everybody in his village that day what he was taught. And they would sit under a guava tree, and he would teach everybody. And slowly and slowly, his fame and his respect grew. And people started thinking this was an amazing thing that was happening, a kid teaching other kids. And more people started coming, and somebody would give a bit of chalk, and somebody would give paper, and a blackboard, and pen, and, and it started continuing. Until CNN heard of him. And CNN gave him $100,000 as a reward for a, being a ch young change maker. Now, anybody else whose father was a very small jute uh, farmer, anybody else would have bought land, bought a house, you know, bought a car. But what did Baba do? He built a school for a thousand children in his village, which was absolutely free. And the condition was that you come and you learn, but every day when you go back to your village, because his village is a small one, you need to teach five to ten children that day. So you pay it forward. And Murshidabad... You know, and, uh, and Murshidabad, uh, which was the last, dead last in Bengal in terms of education statistics, is now somewhere in the top uh, eight, nine. So it shows that one person can make a difference, and that one person is you, all of you. Um, you know, I want to give you an example of... Uh, everybody knows the example of Professor Anand Kumar. And I had gone to see uh, Super 30 in Patna, because I'd heard a lot about it. But you know, one, in politics and life, you grow cynical. You read about these examples, and a lot of you are thinking, and I'm thinking, that I don't know if this is really all that it's cracked up to be. I don't know if this is really all that people saying it is. And I was staying at, uh, at some hotel in Patna. And I remember there was a very fancy, uh, fancily dressed person in a suit and tie, and always getting into some foreign car. And, uh, and then I saw him at Super 30. And I said, uh, I said, uh, oh, have you come here to, to have a look at this, to study it? And he said, no, 10 years ago, I used to study here. And, uh, and I said, OK, where do you live now? And he said, I live in Belgium. 
and I'm the number two of GlaxoSmithKline, which is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. And I said, did you come from a better off family? He said, no, actually, my story is even stranger. He said, there's a place near Patna called Bikram. And he said that my uh, father used to sell vegetables on a patri, on a, on a rail line somewhere there. And uh, he said, I just had this fascination for mathematics and a fascination for learning, but I really didn't know how to go about it since I was completely destitute. So I went to Professor Anand Kumar and I said, sir, if you'll have me, I'll do your household work also. And if you teach me, and he said he kept me in his house for six years, and today I'm in Belgium and I've come back to now have a scholarship ready for 50 students so that they achieve uh, the future of their dreams. And I just thought it was an amazing thing. And, you know, and everywhere in India you go, you see that in the worst possible circumstances, people are the bravest. You know, you go to the Northeast, you go to Kashmir, you go to Bastar, you go to any part of this country, Bundelkhand, where you find people have not been given a fair share and you find the extraordinary courage that they emit and persistently, not just as a one-off. I want to give you an example of an amazing person called Shrikant Bola. You may have heard of this. Shrikant was born blind. He was born completely blind. And he wanted to study science and he enrolled uh, to study science and then they said, no, you can't study science because you're blind. So how will you do the experiments? How will you sit for all this? I'm sorry, you can't do it. So he went to court and he was born in a small village called Sita Ramapuram in, Andhra, in erstwhile Andhra Pradesh. And he went to court and the court ruled in his favor. He said his child can study whatever he wants to study. So he s studied science and he got 99 point something percent and he topped the whole state board. And then he wanted to get into IIT. And after he, when he went to give the exam in IIT, IIT said, I'm sorry, we can't have you because you're blind. So how will you live on campus? How will you eat? You'll have to have a minder with you. We don't have a system like that. So I'm sorry, uh, you know, you can't come into IIT. So he said, all right. So he applied to MIT. And MIT gave him a full scholarship. And he's the only Indian in MIT who ever topped MIT. He uh, topped MIT and he got a gold medal. And he, was and he was completely blind, is completely blind. And, uh, and, and after graduating at the top of your class in MIT, you can understand that the job offers are flowing. So everybody went to him, Google went to him, Oracle went to him, HP went to him, Apple went to him and said, you know, come and work with us, please. And he said, no, I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through in India. And he came back and he set up a company called Bollant Industries. And today it's a 200 crore company. And the amazing thing about this company is that 70% of people that work for it are either blind or they're disabled in some severe manner. You know, and... And the thing is, you know, you don't need to be very old to make a change. Uh, in, on the border of Punjab and Haryana, I came across a girl called Bisman Deo. And uh, it's an amazing example of a, uh, you know, how Delhi, one of the reasons for Delhi's severe pollution is the burning of, of rice husk at the end of every cropping season in large parts of North India. And realizing this, this girl from a village said, you know, why can't we test this husk? And why can't we test it for its properties? Does it ha is it good for anything? Can it be used for anything? So they found that it had a very high silica uh, content and um, that it was, you know, insect resistant. It was actually water resistant and there was a lot that they could do for it. And so she actually went to Punjab University and which is a very good university and she said, would you actually test this to see whether we can make a wood out of it? And they did help her and they created and patented something called green wood. And Hewlett Packard, hearing about this, has now sanctioned 5,000 houses to be built for the poorest people 
to knock their cancerous asbestos houses down and to build green wood houses for them, which will be environmentally sustainable, cheap, and actually get rid of that byproduct, which is just otherwise causing waste and pollution. You know, one of the things that we, uh, in politics, you hear about young people, because young people have become a major catchword. Everybody's talking about, you know, how the youth are going to do this, the youth are going to do this, but you really don't see that many young people in politics. Um, so for just to give you a statistic, uh, the average age now of a young person has gone from 37 in 1952 to 24. But the average age of a parliamentarian has gone in from 1952, which was the first elected parliament, uh, from 46 years to this parliament where the average age was 59 years. So yeah, India is becoming younger, but our politics is becoming older. Uh, and, the, and, you know, unfortunately, the truth of the matter is, unless you have a famous last name like mine, you know, you really will not get an entry into politics. You know, my name is Firoz Varun Gandhi, but if my name was Firoz Varun Agarwal or Khan or Sharma or whatever, the truth is I wouldn't be... I, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't have got a ticket. I wouldn't have been entertained by anybody. And so because, you know, because we know these things and because we're beneficiaries of this unequal system, therefore we have to work 10 times as hard to make sure that the next uh, generation is more equal. And it's, you know, because the fact is that wherever you go in, in India, you find an abundance of talent and an abundance of discipline. I'm an amazed that I came here and I found this hall completely packed. You know, and that just is a credit to all of you for your discipline uh, and for your desire to learn. You know, uh, how can we make a difference? What are the kinds of people making a difference? I want to give you two examples. How many ladies are here today? How many ladies are here? So, about 40 percent, right? I, I, I want to tell you about, about two women that I've seen. I want to tell you about two women that, that I've seen and I met who came from the poorest sections of India and what an amazing change they made. Everybody's heard of Champaran where Gandhiji started his experiments in Bihar. So I went to Champaran and I met this lady who was called Tanju Devi and she, was a, and she had a little shop uh, selling Moomphali and all outside the, the Gandhi uh, ashram in Champaran. And, uh, and she had become a hero. And why had she become a hero? Because in Bihar they have something called the National Social Assistance Program, Rashtriya Samaj. Sahita Yojana, and it was given to people of lower caste, people of disabilities, women, BPL, etc., etc. Except one day it had just stopped, and it stopped for about almost a year. And uh, a foreign student from JNU who spoke Hindi had gone, because he was doing his PhD on Gandhiji, and he had gone to Champaran and he uh, asked this lady, could you show me here, could you show me there, and she, and she showed him around. And he then said, okay, I have a Sony Handycam, so I want to give it to you so that you can take cute videos of your kids or whatever you want. And she did not use it for that. What did she do? She went house to house, and she collected five, ten, twenty second clips of young people, of old people, of women, of the poorest of people, the poor, uh, saying that I'm so-and-so, I'm from this village, and I've not got my yojana for so much time. And because of this one amazing uh, woman, Tanju Devi, 1.4 crore people in the state got this yojana later. And what did they find? Because she went, went and gave it to the DM, who then gave it to the chief minister, and the chief minister th thought it was so amazing that a, that a woman had gone from village to village over one year 
and just persistently taken people's accounts and made vid like tapes of them and kept them. And uh, and why had this happened? Why had the Yojana not gone? Because the office was being shifted from one place to the other, so had it lost all the files and all the you know uh, computerization of information, which is really so unbelievable. So when you become bureaucrats, please be more sensitized to that sort of thing, and don't get you know don't get too in love with your big colonial mansions and people doing salami to you every time. But I will do salami to you, so it's fine, so, so as to get my work done. Um, another amazing woman is uh, called uh, Shimla Kumari, which is in my contiguous district of Ambedkar Nagar in UP. And Shimla Kumari was a laborer at a brick kiln. She's 24 year old. And uh, one day she went to her, uh, to her take it out, to her boss, and she said, uh, you know, I haven't been paid for a week, and we're supposed to be paid every day. So he gave her a whack, and he said, get out. And, uh, and then she felt very insulted, and she felt cheated. And most people would just keep quiet and go back to their home or go to another brick kiln. But she went to the local labor commissioner. And she said that, you know, I'm not going to stand for this, and I want my money. And he said, OK, how much money do you get after doing a full day's work? And she said, I get 70 rupees a day. And he said, wait a minute, you're not supposed to get 70 rupees, you're supposed to get 150 rupees. And she said, nahi, wo mardon ko milta hai. She said, the men get 150 rupees and the women get 70 rupees for the same exact work every day. And she said this, and he said there's something very wrong with this. So he made her, uh, you know, he gave her a car and he said, you are now to go everywhere and you are to talk to women for the next three months and you are to tell me how many women have been cheated in this manner and I will make a uh, record of all the money that has to be paid to the women of this district while I'm here. And just because of that one woman's achievement, not even a woman, a 24 year old girl, you know, from the poorest of the poor, she was a, you know, a, a Balmiki, which you can understand, is a very, uh, uh, community of its rights, of its economic and social rights. And she went to all manner of people and she said that I want uh, you to tell me how many hours you've worked, if you can remember, how much you've been paid and do the mathematics. And because of her, they paid six crore rupees out to the poorest women in the Nagar district because of this one woman. You know, we, am I talking too much? Should I stop now? I, just give me 10 minutes more. Uh, you know, we often don't realize the weapons at our disposal. Yale University did an interesting study in Delhi where they wanted to talk about, uh, they wanted to investigate rather what is the meaning of a RTI, right? What is the meaning of it? So what they did was they got an area in uh, Delhi called uh, Bhalaswa Jahangirpuri, which I think is huh? is near, is near here. Um, and then what they did was they said, okay, we are going to make four groups of people who don't have a ration card. So one of them will be people who do nothing they just apply normally. One group of people will give a recommendation from an NGO. The third group of people will pay a bribe. And the fourth group of people will um, actually file an RTI uh, request along with their application. And they found that in the 11 months of Yale University survey, the first two groups did not get their ration card. But the people who paid the bribe and the people who submitted an RTI application because it spooked the bureaucrats and the local administration a little bit got their ration card in about a month, month and a half's time. You know, a lot of the example of Pushpa uh, Kamla Hingorani, right? 
So, you know, I'm just an amazing example. I, I, I don't need to repeat the whole thing, but a woman, you know, finds out that uh, there are so many people in Patna and in Muzaffarpur in um, jail. Well, actually, that time there were only 18 people that she was investigating, six of them women. And she says, you know, how can we uh, get these people free? Because they've been in jail for longer than their sentence would have been had they been convicted, right? And uh, at that time, you could not file uh, for them, according to Indian law, you couldn't file a, a petition for them unless you were a relative. So she filed a habeas corpus uh, on their uh, behalf, and it was... Uh, called the Hussein Ara Khatun case, and 40,000 people uh, who were awaiting their trials and yet had got no judicial remedy were then freed because they had been in jail for that long. And you know, what is happening is that there is uh, a need to transform citizen engagement and governance in our country because that is the fastest way to justice. Uh, I had... Uh, you know, I've always had this beef with political accountability. I mean, the fact that, you know, we had uh, this case called uh, Lily Thomas versus Union of India, whereby, uh, in 2013, whereby if you get convicted of a serious wrongdoing for more than uh, two years, you are immediately to uh, leave your seat that you occupy, whether MP, MLA, cooperator, etc. And at that very time, in Rajya Sabha, the then government moved an amendment, the Representation of People's Amendments Act, uh, se uh, Second Amendment and Validation Bill, <laughs> 2013, to uh, say that this should be struck down because a certain person who shall go unnamed was being, uh, you know, uh, his verdict was coming in a fodder scam case, and uh, they wanted to protect him. And, of course, under public pressure, they had to withdraw it. But it gives public servants a really bad name. I mean, I put in a private member's bill about right to recall, which I'm very serious about. Because the fact is, look, what is the role of citizenry in India? We have to decide, right? Is the role of citizenry to press a button once in five years? Or is being a citizen, which actually is a, you know, an ancient word which was empowered or imbued with a lot of power? Not everybody, as you know, Professor, was a citizen back in Roman times and, and Greco-Roman times. So the fact is that in today, we have a lacuna in which... We speak for citizens in very golden words, and yet citizens have no power to speak for themselves. But things are changing. There's local media, there's PIL, there's RTI, there's the judiciary. You know, there, there, are, there is hope out there today which our parents' generation did not have. And we are empowered in new ways. I just want to give you two or three examples about this. In Latvia, erstwhile Russia, um, USSR, 23-year-old girls, two girls, as a joke, wrote to the pre president, the prime minister, and said, if we get 20% of our country in Latvia to agree on one issue, and they uh, called it Mana Bals, my voice, then will you initiate a debate in parliament? He said no, and as a joke, he wrote back an email, and he said, if you get 20% of Latvia to agree on one issue, I will put it to vote to make it a law in the parliament. And because this was then taken very seriously, of course, Latvia is a poor country. I mean, it's a small country. It only has 20 lakh people. But at the same time, these two girls had now made a movement, and they have made 16 laws in the last three years just by themselves. Um, you know, we would, I was talking about how young people can't get into politics, into public life. So Jordan has actually a ministry called the Ministry of Political Development, where they actually go and interview young people at, in every block of the country. 
and they find people who are brave, who are energetic, who have a vision, and then they say, okay, which party would you like to be a part of? You know, which ideology do you represent? And then they recommend them to those parties, and they recommend at least 500 people per district every year. And they say that we um, recommend that you put these people in your outfit. And so there's a constant infusion of new blood, and it's not stuck. In, uh, in Pakistan, actually, I found a very interesting example called um, by a girl called Sadia Khatri posted a picture of herself and her friends at uh, a dhaba and she hashtagged it on Instagram called girls at dhabas. Now this may sound very silly to you uh, but you know the thing is that in our countries particularly in the subcontinent there are very archaic gender roles you know and there is a very uh, subversive male patriarchy um, that you can see by the fact that there are four men and one lady sitting here addressing you today. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the fact is that what she wanted to show was not just to break through these archaic roles, but also to make public places more women-friendly, right? I mean, I eat at dhabas all the time when I'm going up and down uh, you know, places. I never, ever see any women there except when they're accompanied by their husbands you know, or their brothers. Think about it, right? So are public places in 2017 in India not safe for women? Or can women not dare to actually do that? So they hashtag this and it went completely viral in Pakistan. And it's, I'm very proud of these people for doing so. And, uh, and then women, and then these uh, women, girls at Dhabas became a very strong community. And then they became a little braver, and now they've made something called um, uh, Girls on Bikes, which is uh, very brave, and it's a new campaign. You know, but it's all in the same direction, as you can see, which is uh, wonderful. Lastly, I want to talk about young people helping themselves by helping other people. Social entrepreneurship. All of you would like to make a change, but you would also like to be financially secure. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that. Um, and so I want to talk about a few examples of just people I've seen along the way. Uh, I met an amazing person uh, called Dhruv Lakra in Bombay. And in 2006, he was on a bus and uh, he saw a deaf and dumb person st uh, sitting there. And he thought to himself, what can this person achieve in life? You know, what can this person do? How can he earn a decent, uh, you know, existence? And he said, that's very difficult. And then when he went home that same day, somebody had come to him to deliver a courier. And he saw courier service is one thing where you don't need to speak, where you don't need to hear. And he started something called Miracle Couriers just for people who can't speak and who can't hear in the city of Mumbai. And today, there are 500 people just in Mumbai and Pune and Greater Mumbai, Thane, etc. There are 500 people who are deaf and dumb who are earning at least 20 to 25,000 rupees a month in this miracle courier service of his. So I think it was Another uh, young person that I came about is uh, my friend Durgesh Nandan, who now lives in Bombay and used to live in Delhi and then before that in Ghazipur and then in Lucknow. And Durgesh Nandan started a uh, automotion ads whereby, because he saw that people who drive auto rickshaws and three-wheelers, they uh, don't have um, they, ownership of those vehicles. And they drive them for 16 hours, 18 hours a day, almost like slaves. And yet they never own them. Some Sage owns them somewhere. And they said, uh, you know, he said, can we create a system where these people have a more empowered existence, where at least they own the asset and control the asset that they uh, drive? 
And so what they, he did was he created this company called Automotion Ads, whereby 50% of the money that you, you can advertise on the vehicle, 50% of it goes to the driver, 25% goes to Durgesh Nandan, and 25% goes to the owner, who was happy because he was getting money you know, that was untapped before. And just because of this, in the cities of Kanpur, in the cities of Lucknow, in the cities of Banaras and Bareilly, etc., you today have 700 people who own their auto rickshaws in the last five years who could never dream of owning their own vehicles, and today they have an existence of self-respect and dignity, which is the most important human condition there is. I, uh, you know, there's lots of government schemes. You, you always hear about government schemes, good government schemes, but how many people really hear about them? Very few, right? Because A, people may not be literate enough, or they might be perfectly literate, but they might not have the confidence to go to the district administration and actually liaise with them and talk to them and say, hey, what about me? Why am I not getting my right? So a young person in Maharashtra made a mobile phone platform you must look at called Hak Darshak. And what, what Hak Darshak does is, if you put your gender, your age, your name, your caste, your financial condition, and proof of it, and pay a nominal amount like 10 rupees, what it will do is it will list all the government schemes that you're entitled to, both center and state. For a further 50 rupees, what it does is it will coordinate with that government department and it will ensure that they, that money is then deposited in your account. And I wasn't really sure whether this worked. So yesterday I found one of the phone numbers of women who had uh, reportedly benefited uh, from this from uh, Hamirpur in uh, Himachal Pradesh. And I called up this lady and I said, look, your name is there. Is it real? And first she couldn't believe that it was me calling her. But when she uh, said hi and stuff, and then she said that, uh, yes, I used to get 1,100 rupees a month. And now because of this, I get 3,400 rupees a month, which I thought it was great, you know, sitting at home. Uh, you know, and lastly, I just want to give an example of... Uh, of a person called Navneet Ranjan, who was in America, and uh, I think he was at Harvard, actually. And he came back to do a documentary in Dharavi, which is the largest slum in Asia, in Mumbai. And, uh, you know, Mumbai is an amazing city because it has the richest people in India and it has the poorest people in India. And so, um, but at the same time, he said, I'll do a... Uh, a documentary and then he said what's the use of doing a documentary you know how is it going to help these people it's just in a way just prostituting their poverty right so he said I'm not going to do this I'm actually going to help them and so first he started taking classes just with the girls because he found that the girls were much more uh, you know uh, much more disadvantaged than the boys who actually did go to school most of them and uh, when he did that, he found that even that wasn't helping them because more than science and history and physics and mathematics, they actually needed to learn something that would empower them financially right now. So he taught them computer coding and he taught them how to make apps on MIT App Inventor. And, uh, and I was looking at some of the apps that have done extraordinarily well on Google Play Store, Apple, etc., and I just want to tell you about two of them, and they're both by young girls. One is a 15-year-old girl called Fawzia Aslam Ansari, who's made an amazing app, which has actually been sold 100,000 times, called Pani Hejivan. So what it does is that she liaises with uh, valve engineers and pump engineers and tells you the next day when the water will come and for how long it'll come. And so because you know in small towns, in slums, in areas of lower income group housing, there's a lot of fighting about water. And there's a lot of time wasting, you know, because people will sit there for hours not knowing when the water will come and the women of the house will spend, you know, three, four hours every day. And so this tells you and it forms an online queue for you 
So it tells you, okay, today 1,200 people have signed up for water, and your turn today is 1224 to 1248, and please be there at that time, because after you is that person, before you is that person. I thought it was amazing. And then a 15-year-old, another 15-year-old girl called Ansuja Madhiwan, who made an app called Women Fight Back. Uh, and this is an app um, that basically does location mapping for women in distress, women who are being harassed or eve teased. And it uh, has 100 of your emergency contacts listed. And immediately, an emergency alarm or an SMS alert goes out to them, to 100 people who you know. It then sends an alert out to your nearest police station, that your nearest geographical police station. And it also um, sends out a distress alarm where you are and location mapping. And I thought it was amazing for a 15-year-old girl to have done this. And that also has sold a lot of times. Uh, and the last thing is feeding people, because I think this is the most sacred thing. And Ankit Quatra, who started Feeding India, who I work with, and I've actually put in a petition in Parliament saying that all the waste food in Parliament should actually be quartered, it should be cleaned, and it should be given to people, at least the slums in a five-kilometer uh, vicinity around Parliament, because just in Parliament every day, you have lots and lots of wasted food. And so what Ankit Quatra did was one day he was at a wedding, and as you know, in North India, the weddings are very lavish and they're very wasteful, in fact, in terms of food. And so many tons of food gets wasted every day, and just thrown out. And this goes for five-star hotels, it goes for Dhaba. So he just tied up with all of these places, and he said, whatever my vans will come, and he was a 23-year-old guy, and he said, you give me your food, I will clean it, and then I will give it. And today, 10 lakh people eat meals because of this every day. And, uh, you know, I just uh, want to end my uh, interaction here today by saying just one thing, which is we need revolutionaries in our country. They do not need to be revolutionaries that pick up the gun but they need to be revolutionaries that make sure that other people don't pick up the gun. They, they, they need to be people who spread kindness, who act as protection for other people, and who are agents of goodness. All of us at some point realize that this is a finite, entity, this thing called life. And we have about 30 to 40 years in our life where we can really give back actively. This is your time, and this is my time. This is our time. And I just want to end with a proverb that means a lot to me, which is that if you want to go fast, walk alone. But if you want to go far, Let's all walk together. And I want to thank you for showing me the respect of sitting here and being such an active and wonderful uh, audience all across here and the country. And I'm delighted to be here at ALS, and I hope I get called back once again. Thank you. Should I take it off? I'll take it off, and then you... Yeah. Sure. Perhaps you can interact from there. I can interact from here. It's fine. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so is there I, any questions? Yeah, we'll have the questions very soon, but I uh, will have to hand it over. Can, can I take it from your pocket, please? Yeah. <laughs> I oh. knew you wanted to take something from my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know what? Uh, this is just a second before I hand it over to Professor Rekha Saxena, and uh, we'll have the interactions. You know, you heard him now, and uh, you know, while I was hearing him as well, you know, there was something which was going in my mind. Uh, you know, I took a course with uh, Thomas Poggy, who's a you know, student of John Rawls, and in the class, first time, he showed us a slide, and the slide was rice versus rocket, and he was referring to India, because we are having rockets, as you know, 
but we're also having the dearth of rice for millions of people in this country. Uh, you know, he's, what he's saying makes sense. Uh, you know, he's trying to tell you kind of this inspiring uh, stories as he did. It's a bottoms-up movement. But let me tell you, Varunji, that there's a top-down thing also. If half of our MPs become half as good as you are, And for that to happen, it's you. But for you to do that, it again comes back to people like him to go around, go around, talk to people like you. I know he's on that mission. May God bless you. And may you continue to do your tremendous good work that you're doing. Because Juan Gandhi taught us, be the change that you want to be. I hope uh, the other Gandhi will continue to do that. And uh, so please, uh, you're welcome for the interactive session. Be humble. <laughs> you are humble. <laughs> but uh, just remember, the questions should be only around the topic that we are here for today. We are not here for anything else, just for the topic. And so therefore, be brief. And, and start your questions. I hand it over to Rekha Ji. Just a minute. Uh, I know that you are all emotional about what uh, our uh, honorable speaker has said about the whole thing. But uh, be specific. So we have a paucity of time. So and uh, ask questions which are relevant to the topic which we discussed. And, and we are very, all are emotional about because the injustice the going on the in the country. There is no doubt about this. They want some, they want some water. Oh, they won't hear it otherwise. No, no. Please be focused and brief. Yeah. These are the questions which will come from centers. Yeah. So you stand this side. Uh, we are running out of time, in? so we yeah. can entertain two, three questions. Okay? And please be brief and no, focused. You, Thank uh, you. So you just How do I do it? Just, just put it. Clip it. Yeah. Just one second. Again in your Yeah. 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 Hello, sir. Hi. I'm Archie. Hi. Uh, actually, I really agree with your point that rich poor divide is aggravating. And I see that youth are foundation of this nation. It's okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Youth are the foundation of nation, but most of them are deprived of a good education and which leads them to not getting a good decent job and which yeah. eventually leads to a rise in crime rate. I can so, hear the lady. Yeah. So I just want to ask <laughs> I want to ask that how a state can shoulder the responsibility to uh, you know effectively providing qualitative education so that all of us can have assistance. You know I just have one suggestion. Uh, thank you for your question. It's an important question and uh, which is that I don't remember Hello. I I uh, I thought this very fancy looking lady was scolding me. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say one thing. It's a very serious question. Uh, just one suggestion, which is, uh, or rather two suggestions. One is, can we have public-private partnerships in education? In, uh, I, uh, Honorable uh, Professor Saab and I have discussed this. I was in Qatar, and I visited what are called charter schools. So charter schools are basically where they took people who had invested in private education for 30 years, 40 years, and they said, okay, you will run now government schools, except 30% will be paying people, and 70% will continue to be absolutely free, and it will subsidize that. You will scale up the institution, so where 1,000 people were studying, 5,000 people can study, and qualitatively, obviously, it will improve because that person is making money, but they're also doing good. The second thing which can happen, uh, the second thing which can happen, seriously, is that I think we have 700, 
I think the exact figure is 712 universities in our country. And I think we have about 36,000 colleges in our country, right? So if we have an increased system of volunteerism, right? If we have an increased system of a person who, when he graduates, for say even one year, can be assigned a particular area in India as per their geographical preference, and they can go there and live in small towns or in villages, and uh, we can create an infrastructure around this program, and they can teach. We'll never have a shortage of teachers again in our country. Because today we have a shortage of, what, five, seven lakh teachers in our country? You know, so I think these two things are something to think about. Yeah, any, any other question? Any other question? Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, please. So we are having gender balance. Yes. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, here we are discussing the topic prospects of just India. Though it is more about social justice, but uh, my point is how can you achieve just India without the just and fair institution of judiciary? As you spoke yourself, that had it not been Gandhi attached to your name, you would not have been in politics. Right. Don't you think that this rotten collegian system of judiciary should be, re should be replaced by all India judiciary exam or something? Like, it is more like turning into monarchy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more you know, you are a braver lady than I am <laughs> uh, to criticize the judiciary. But, you know, I'll tell you wh what I, d I do feel, which is that uh, I think you've raised a very important point, and I have to agree with you. You know, and I don't have anything further to say, except that I totally agree with what you're saying. And unless the pillars of our democracy are not gentrified, uh, you know, we will not go where we need to go as a nation. So thank you for your valid point. La any last question? Last yeah. Yeah, okay. Sure. Like any, anywhere. Yeah, please. Sir, I want to seek your permission to discuss a case in bit elaboration just after the session ends. Sure, absolutely, please. Thank you, sir. What's Thank your you. name? Archita Desai, sir. Sure, we'll, we'll just go out and discuss it. Okay. Any other, Thank you. one last question? Yeah, please, the gentleman. Yeah. My name is Jay Surya. Yeah. I want to ask you a question. As a, India is a big country, yeah. and it's a big nation, yeah. what the thing is happening is it's full of injustice. It's going on. Because as a, many more parliament members are there, and they are working for it. What they are doing is, some of them are growing their own house, but not the nation. The thing is happening here. They are growing their own home, but not the thinking of the country and the poor people. Why they are doing like this? It's the bad thing. They are educated. I, I get it's a serious question. Yeah. They are educated and they should know the value of the persons and the life. But why they are doing like this? I am not knowing. Because as an educated person, he should think of himself and he should think of the nation. His duty is to look of the world, of the nation. That's the main thing. Uh, I think it's a very good question by Jay Surya Ji. I, see, I'd like to say this, just, some, just to take it on a different tangent. Look, your point about politicians is, is well taken. It's correct. But I'd like to say that why... Are you standing here for a reason, sir? Okay. Yeah, so I just want to say one thing, which is, look, we need urgent political reform in our country. And one issue that nobody is talking about is campaign finance reform, okay? So, for instance, why is it that in our country, um, every election upon election is getting three, four, five times as expensive as the last? Now, what is happening is, if you look at it very in a cool-minded manner, politics increasingly is the barriers to entry, the financial barriers to entry are rising, right? So earlier, a poor person could become successful in politics based on his ideas, based on his courage. No longer. No longer. Today, the first thing that's... Where, where are you from? 
Right. So you're from Karnataka, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you look at your own home state of Karnataka, you will see that the average income of an MLA and an MP as compared to 1952 to 2017, the average income as per average income in Karnataka society. In 1952, the disparity between them, which means how much richer are leaders than the average members of society, the disparity would have been somewhat there. But today, it's probably massive, right? You have people from Karnataka, no names taken, who are giving Rolls Royces away in their children's weddings in districts where there is no water, right? So I don't want to talk about one person or one party or one family. I want to talk about the country and policy as a whole. So why can't we have a very strong election commission in our country? which can curb election spending, which can disbar candidates, which can be a, you know, not a toothless tiger. And what we need today is, in Scandinavia, I had given the example in an earlier interaction uh, where Honorable Professor Rekhaji was there, where I talked about, I think it's no way, if I'm not mistaken, where elections are end to end two weeks. And you're not allowed to advertise on TV. You're not allowed to advertise on papers. In papers, you're not allowed to uh, use hoardings or billboards. And so there's no limit to how much you can spend. But actually, they've controlled the supply. You know, the, there, is, there is no demand for expenditure. So in India, if we can make elections about ideas and not about capacity to spend, you will find corruption in politics is down 50% just from there. Because what is happening is, is becoming like a vicious cycle. You need to get elected, you need to get re-elected, so therefore you put pressure on the system and amass resources in order that you perpetuate your pol politics. It's a vicious cycle, it needs to be broken somewhere. One last question. Yes. Any, any of these, any, anything, any of Okay, there's a very good question from Thane, which is why are we spending a less percentage of our education as a percentage of GDP? And look, I want to say that it's, it's a flagrant violation. We should, when Pandit Nehru was prime minister in uh, the 40s and the 50s, we were spending almost 10% of our GDP on education. Today, we're spending one third that, right? But I want to talk about, even in this expenditure, how much are we really spending on education? Today, do you know that when we talk about right to education, do you know that 60% of the spending in that is just on building buildings? It's just on what in Hindi you call bhavan nirman, which means nothing, right? Because, you know, you can learn very well under a tree. You shouldn't have to, but you can. But the point is that today we are building these schools and more schools, and I'm happy for that. But what about investing in teacher training? What about investing in qualitative education like you get at ALS right here? So my point is that at the end of the day, you have to spend at least 75% of your education budget on pure education, you know, on a didactic method, on learning. Because if you're just going to create educational infrastructure, you know, it's not good enough. There's no imparting of, of uh, value-based information. So my point is that um, there's actually very good questions here. And so they are obviously very brilliant people watching this. Um, no, but I'm amazed at them, actually. Uh, you see, my point is very simple, which is that at the end of the day, we don't have to. I wrote an article for the Economic Times uh, a couple of weeks ago saying we should use non-alignment as a weapon. 
We don't need to follow the American model. We don't need to follow the Soviet model or the Chinese model. You know, we can make our own indigenous model. We are a country that is much more ancient than any country around us. And yet, the multiculturalism that we have in India is our greatest asset. So whether it is an Islamic influence, an influence of South India, whether we have an influence from Central Asia, an influence of the Northeast, all these add to our wealth. And this amazing uh, mixture that comes out of it is what really makes us as Indians so special because it's the desire to always elevate without the desire to suppress anything else or anybody else. So that's all uh, I want to say. Thank you so much and I want to thank everybody that listened on Facebook and all over in ALS centers and I want to thank all of you and I do want to make a request to all of you uh, are most of you on Twitter and Facebook? Some of you? Okay, my account is Varun Gandhi 80. Varun Gandhi 80. And I want you to follow me and I want you to interact with me and tell me what issues you think I should flag in Parliament, what issues I should fight for. I see you, I'm going to come to you last. And I, what issues I think that we should discuss and take up and how we can work together in things that you're interested in. Yeah, last question. Yes, last question, please. Now I can take this off? Yeah. yeah. No, but you'll have to answer. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, sir, uh, as Just you talked about... Just keep it brief. Yeah. Just keep sir, it brief, yeah. Sir, as you talked about the increasing poverty rate due to medical and pharmaceutical expenditure. Yeah. Can't we stop the commercialization of uh, hospitals and other services or else uh, the government must have full control on their uh, what they are charging for the, uh, to the patient? So you basically said what I said. Yes, uh, sir, can't we stop the commercialization of the hospitals? No, stopping the commercialization of hospitals is not the answer. The answer is two things. One. You go to Apollo Hospital, you go to any hospital in India, you know, you will find that they're supposed to give a certain amount of percentage of their beds for poor people, a certain amount of percentage of their medicines for charity. It's never done. So firstly, that needs to be ensured. And the second thing that needs to be done is that government expenditure on health care uh, needs to increase. And as I said, you see, announcing All India Medical Institutes across the country is not the answer. Because today there are many IITs. Professors are going from the Delhi IIT over the weekend to teach there because there are no professors that are, you know, are there. So just more number of institutions does not make a country great. It's the enforcing the sanctity of those institutions that make it great. So when you're talking about hospitals, you know, we need to look at hospitals as a way to avoid poverty as well. And so we need to look at out-of-pocket expenditure as a percentage of total income. And we need to make sure that it's around about 10% because otherwise this country is going to have where one crore people are growing poorer every year, you'll have three crore people growing poorer and soon, you know, you'll have a bad uh, scene. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the, just the last uh, part of it. Uh, may I request uh, our director, Jojo Matthews, to... Pres present a memento to Honorable Barun Gandhiji. And may I now request uh, Manish to uh, present a similar memento to Professor Rekha Saxena.
And last, uh, but certainly not the least, the bundle of energy is just about to be here <laughs> to say his vote of thanks. Thank you. Respected uh, Varun Gandhi ji, respected Professor Dr. Rekha Saxena ji, my friend Chandrachur ji, Manish, and uh, other staff, students, and well-wishers. First of all, I would like to thank Varun Gandhi ji for coming here and uh, opening a discussion on a topic which we all used to speak, talk, write, and sometimes emotionally get charged up. <laughs> and you have once again added some more, uh, you know, I'll say, energy into our own thoughts and talks which we used to have. And as a part of the topic, as part of the general studies and the topics which you study, all these issues which you have taken up are always there. And uh, we are more than happy that people like you are equally, or if not more, uh, you know, worried and uh, more energized for doing something for the society and for the country. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming and honoring us. And we are really honored that you are here and our students are honored because they could get more ideas and uh, the philosophies and the thoughts and what we need to do. And uh, as individuals from you, I would like to take only one point today, that all of us can be a part of the change, what we all would like to see in India. And you have done a great job for inspiring us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to ALS. And I also although thank Madam and Sir for organizing this event for us. Thank you so much. Thanks for all of you. And one small announcement, my class. <laughs> I will be starting at 2.30. Uh, okay. So please be there. Thank you so much.